Well, good day, everybody. Um, welcome to this. Uh, welcome to this session. Thank you all for the time that you've put aside for this. Um, just like to uh, acknowledge the fact that this session has been organised by ICRAF, the International Centre for Research in Agroforestry, or World Agroforestry, along with our colleagues in GIZ in Bonn and. IUCN in Washington, D.C. Um, what we, um, to get started, we've got two jumping off points for this meeting. The first is we're doing this remotely because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And one thing that the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated to us is the susceptibility of our existing food systems. Around the world, we found that farmers found themselves separated from their sources of livelihood during lockdowns, labor was disrupted, labor was dispersed, local value chains broke down, exports were disrupted because international trade was affected as a result of uh, interruptions in transport. It's clear that the post-COVID recovery has to, has to be much more resilient than the situation we found ourselves in up to now. The second jumping off point for this session is that even before then, we knew we had to change. The, the, there was beginning to be a great deal of attention paid to the seriousness of the decline of our natural resources and global efforts were underway to change the way that our economies work and our economies interact with the environment and in particular with biodiversity. One effort is the review of the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, the CBD, which is setting out a strategy for the period of 2020 to 2050. So what we're gonna be discussing today is the need for agricultural landscapes to become biodiverse, to become biodiversity friendly, to become productive and to become resilient. And we're going to bring in a number of excellent speakers who are going to take us through this. What we know is that we, we all, what we, what we, our position is that we're pretty sure that agricultural systems are vital to the conservation of biodiversity and food systems should increasingly be based on cutting edge field level technologies, which are based on ecological principles with an emphasis on local processing and distribution with shorter value chains. We believe that the CBD must recognize the importance of agricultural landscapes when setting its future strategy. Um, we recognize that we need much better understanding of the productivity and profitability of integrated mixed farming. For 40 to 50 years, we have poured a huge amount of research effort into basically how to grow single crops more intensively. Uh, we, we lack the, the research to, to, to demonstrate and to make sure that integrated mixed farming can match the productivity um, and all of the, uh, and with many other advantages. And we need to better understand the balance between global and national food, uh, food supply chains. Now, what we're doing here, involved in putting this session together are scientists. But what we've done today is we brought together a number of very experienced practitioners who are going to take us through their experience in this field of mixed agriculture. I'll be introducing them one by one as we go along. But basically what we've done is we brought in a farmer from Northern Europe. We brought in an agricultural expert from India getting into the tropics. Um, we've brought in someone who works with the private sector. We've brought in an NGO and we brought in someone representing central government at a very high level. So those are the people who are going to be taking us through a number of short presentations today. Now, our first presenter, unfortunately, cannot be with us. Um, he's a farmer. He's a very busy man and he hasn't been able to be, to be here. But he is Peter Zenz. He is a German farmer. He farms near Cologne in Germany. In, in addition, he's the director of a voluntary project called Nutrition and Consumption, um, which is part of the Cologne Climate Council. And he and his farm is a member of an initiative with a very fascinating title, Biodiversity in Good Company. Uh, we asked uh, Peter 
a couple of questions before he put together his, his video presentation. We asked him basically as a European farmer with some very interesting ideas about the future of agriculture, just to tell us a little bit about his approach to farming and his approach to agriculture. We then challenged him with the observation that often a reason given for the lack of adoption of sustainable agriculture or ag organic ag agriculture is that it yields less than conventional approaches. It won't feed the world and farm incomes are low. We said to Peter, you're a practicing farmer. You practice circular agriculture. You practice sustainable agriculture. Could you tell us how you respond to this challenge? And if anything, what needs to change? And now we can roll the video with his response to this. Please, Trevor. Herzlich willkommen hier bei mir auf dem Erlebnisbauernhof der Trudenhof in Hürth bei Köln. Ja, wir sitzen hier mitten in unserer Kürbisscheune. Und äh, die Kürbisscheune ist ein gutes Beispiel dafür, wie wir hier auf dem Gertrudenhof bei Köln unsere Landwirtschaft praktizieren. Saisonal, regional, nachhaltig, je nach Jahreszeit, immer das, was gerade auf unseren Feldern wächst, äh, zeigen wir unseren Besuchern hier und äh, vermarkten unsere komplette Ernte direkt in der Region zu Besuchern, die uns alltäglich besuchen. Ähm, das sind eben nicht 10, nicht 100, sondern das sind auch zumindest vor Corona-Zeiten, an einem Wochenende oft auch einige tausend Menschen hier direkt aus der naheliegenden Großstadt Köln zu uns rausfahren, auf den Hof Führungen auf unsere Felder machen, ähm, einkaufen hier in unserem großen Hofladen und auch äh, die leckeren saisonalen Dinge dann auch direkt auf der Gabel genießen, denn wir haben auch eine eigene Gastromeile, wo wir saisonale Gerichte anbieten, die jetzt im Herbst in der Kürbiszeit, ein Kürbisflammkuchen, äh, ein Kürbissecko gibt es dazu und äh, viele weitere Dinge, die eben gerade aus der Jahreszeit dazu passen. Kürbissuppe darf natürlich auch nicht fehlen. Ja, und äh, das ist was, was sich in den letzten Jahren bei uns so entwickelt hat, dass wir irgendwann gesagt haben, wir hören auf damit, für den Weltmarkt zu produzieren, wir hören auf damit, monokulturell nur einige Kulturen anzubauen und die über den Handel zu vermarkten, sondern wir bauen wieder eine Vielzahl an Kulturen an, über 30 das Jahr hinweg auf unseren eigenen Feldern, die wir geschlossen vermarkten über unseren Hofladen, in dem es natürlich auch noch eine Menge mehr zu kaufen gibt, hier aus der Region von vielen Partnerhöfen, mit denen wir zusammenarbeiten und kooperieren. So hat der Kunde, Köln ist nicht weit, Köln eine Millionenstadt, mit vielen Familien natürlich, die vor allen Dingen unseren Hof besuchen, hier sieben Tage die Woche die Möglichkeit, frische, saisonale Produkte einzukaufen und eben auch die Landwirtschaft hautnah zu erleben, was ein ganz, ganz wichtiger Faktor ist, den ich sehe. Denn nur wenn die Menschen erleben, wie es wächst, wenn die Menschen den Unterschied kennenlernen, wenn die Menschen auch neugierig werden auf das, was gerade Saison hat, dann haben sie auch ein Interesse daran und dann kaufen sie es auch. Weil dann ist auch der Unterschied zum Supermarkt spürbar und erlebbar. Und das Essen wird mehr als ein Satt werden, sondern etwas, worüber man erzählt. Und äh, wenn man eben die Saisonalität spürt und schmeckt, bekommt man auch Lust darauf. Man muss das Ganze nicht ganz verkopft machen, sondern mit ganz viel Genuss und Freude. Und auch dafür werben wir in unserem Schulbauernhof. Ähm, vor Corona hatten wir etwa 1000 Führungen pro Jahr, wo wir Schulklassen, Kindergärten, und auch Kindergeburtstage hier auf unseren Hof eingeladen und geführt haben, wo wir zusammen geerntet haben und äh, bei jeder Führung auch immer die verschiedenen Dimensionen mit betrachtet haben. Zum einen eben, ähm, ja, was ist Landwirtschaft, wie funktioniert Landwirtschaft, wo sind die Probleme der Landwirtschaft, ähm, was sind die Zusammenhänge und die Schwierigkeiten, aber eben auch das Thema Lebensmittelverschwendung und nachhaltiger Konsum. Und was hat das ganze Einkaufen auch für eine Bedeutung für unser Klima? Denn wenn man mit einem Kind in der ersten Klasse schon die Kartoffel aus der Erde rupft und zusammen aushakt und man dann dem Kind sagt, welche Kartoffel würdest du wegschmeißen, dann ist jeder Einzelne für ihn ein kleiner Schatz. Und das Kind sagt, keine würde ich wegschmeißen. Und genau da kann man anfangen und erklären, warum Lebensmittelverschwendung so ein Wahnsinn ist. Warum es so ein Wahnsinn ist, dass eben die zu kleinen, zu dicken Kartoffeln oft weggeschmissen werden. Warum es ein Wahnsinn ist, dass viele Verbraucher eben nicht auf Lebensmittel achten, weil der Preis nicht mehr der Wert ist, den es darstellt. Und so werden die Kinder dann schon zu Botschaftern der Nachhaltigkeit 
und äh, tragen das in ihre Familien ein und äh, kommen so auch oft zu uns wieder auf den Hof und zu uns einkaufen. Und ähm, ja, so ist das Ganze ein sehr geschlossenes System, was wir äh, in den letzten Jahren aufgebaut haben. Äh, wie gesagt, wo wir mit den Kindern schon anfangen, ihnen erzählen, was wir tun und viele Eltern und Erwachsene dann mitkommen äh, und neugierig werden auf uns und äh, uns dann wieder und wieder besuchen, in unserem Hofladen einkaufen kommen und wir es so geschafft haben, eben davon wegzukommen, für Europa und die Welt zu produzieren und stattdessen jetzt für die Menschen produzieren, die um uns herum wachsen, nicht der Wachsen, die um uns herum wohnen und äh, die dann sehen können, wie alles wächst auf unseren Feldern. Und was da so abenteuerlich klingt und auch als Geschäftsmodell, was ja auch wichtig ist, weil eine Dimension der Nachhaltigkeit ist, auch die Wirtschaftlichkeit, auch als Geschäftsmodell funktioniert, klingt so, so simpel wie abenteuerlich, denn es ist eigentlich nichts anderes, als mein Großvater vor 50 Jahren schon gelebt hat. Nämlich auch er hat eine Vielfalt von Kulturen angebaut hier auf dem Hof und hat es damals nur nicht direkt ab Hof verkauft, sondern ist eben mit den Waren in die Stadt gefahren, auf die Märkte und hat es verkauft. Nur die Marktstruktur in der Großstadt ist eben nicht mehr so wie vor 50 Jahren. Auf den Märkten gibt es nur noch Händler, die auch gekaufte Produkte vermarkten, die meistens sogar noch nicht mal regional sind. Und so ist diese Vermarktungsform weggefallen. Es gab früher Erzeugergenossenschaften, wo man dann eben regional die Waren hingebracht hat und die dann regional weiterverteilt wurden. An die vielen, vielen kleinen Händler, auch die gibt es nicht mehr, sondern es gibt wenig Monopolisten, die den ganzen Marktsegment beherrschen. Und so ist diese ganze Struktur irgendwann zusammengebrochen und äh, immer mehr Landwirte, so auch wir, waren gezwungen, immer weniger Kulturen, immer professioneller, immer größer anzubauen und damit aber eben immer monokultureller und mit weniger gutem Eintrag für Biodiversität. Und äh, ja, wir haben es geschafft, in den letzten Jahren diesen Kreis zu durchbrechen, unseren Betrieb neu aufzubauen und eben diese andere Form der Landwirtschaft wieder zu etablieren, die so ein bisschen nahe dem ist, was mein Opa vor 50 Jahren gemacht hat. Und was auch dem nahe ist, was er gemacht hat, nämlich gut auf den Boden zu achten, den er hat, zu wissen, was braucht der Boden, damit er gesund bleibt. Eben nicht Monokulturen, große Flächen, sechs Jahre lang dieselbe Kultur hintereinander, sondern eine mehrgliedrige, mehrjährige Fruchtfolge, wo der Boden auch immer wieder das zurückerhält, was er anschließend der Pflanze geben kann, damit diese gut wachsen kann. Dazu gehören blühende Zwischenfrüchte, wo wir eben den Boden gesund machen, aber auch unserer Flora und Fauna Gutes tun, weil diese blühenden Zwischenfrüchte sind natürlich ein richtiges Buffet für Bienen und Insekten, aber auch Schonung und Deckungsraum für Rebhühner und Hasen. Und ähm, ja, all das mussten wir wieder entdecken, damit eben ein Kreislauf entsteht, der eben Boden und Natur gesund hält und gleichzeitig uns verhilft, eben auch weniger Pflanzenschutz einzusetzen. Denn wenn Boden und Natur drumherum gesund ist, dann ist das auch möglich. Wenn man immer wieder hört, dass gesagt wird, dass eine nachhaltige Landwirtschaft die Welt nicht ernähren kann, werde ich immer ganz schön wütend. Denn das, was die Welt bestimmt nicht ernähren kann, ist, wenn global wenige Sorten von wenigen Firmen angebaut werden, die überhaupt nicht mehr angepasst sind an die Standorte. Das sortenfeste Saatgut, das seit Jahrhunderten, Jahrtausenden in verschiedenen Gebieten überliefert worden ist, das hält vielen, vielen Naturkatastrophen stand und sichert Ernten und Erträge vor Ort überall. Und ich glaube, diesen Schutz und diese Weiterentwicklung brauchen wir umso mehr. Und das kann gelingen, wenn auch die Ernte regional dort vermarktet wird, wo sie angebaut wird. Und dann kommt es eben nicht dazu, dass aus Europa noch anderen Teilen der Welt die Ernte weggenommen wird, weil sie her importiert wird. Und dann muss es eben so passieren, dass überall dort Nahrungsmittel angebaut werden, die dort saisonal sind, weil dann sind die Erträge gut, dann braucht man wenig Pflanzenschutzmittel und dann hat man auch eine sichere Ernte und kann so viele, viele Menschen auch satt machen. Und der zweite Vorteil, den ich absolut sehe, ist von einer regionalen Vermarktung und von einer nachhaltigen Landwirtschaft ist, dass eben auch die ganze Ernte vermarktet wird. In der industriellen Landwirtschaft wird oft nur ja, das vermarktet, was wirklich optimal gewachsen ist, äh, wie aus der Maschine heraus, in der gleichen Form, gleichem Aussehen hat. Und alles andere, was dem nicht genügt, wird weggeschmissen. Viele, viele unserer Lebensmittel werden weggeschmissen, das wissen wir alle. Und wenn man diese Chance nutzt und all das, was im Moment in der Tonne landet, wieder auf den Teller bringt, dann, glaube ich, ist auch genug für uns alle da. 
Und deshalb hoffe ich, dass wir alle heute dazu beitragen können, dass eine regionale, nachhaltige Landwirtschaft, eine Kreislaufwirtschaft, eine Biowirtschaft vorankommt und die Menschen in der Welt wieder satter macht als heute. An elementary mistake, I was muted, I apologize. Thank you again to Peter, Peter Zenz in his absence. I would remind you that as a farmer in Europe, where usually the incentive system associated with payments drives people down certain forms of agriculture. And this is a real heartfelt, passionate pitch, I thought, for different sorts of agriculture based on local value chains, based on local marketing, based on local production and variability. Now, that was a message from the North. Similar progress is being made in tropical countries, and we're finding we're places where mixed farming is proving to be successful, land is managed well, and biodiversity is being conserved. Our next speaker is Dr. Thomas Jacob. He's an advisor at PMA Development Society Organic Spices. He's had more than 40 years of professional experience in the field of production of various crops like rubber, spices, aromatics, medicinal plants, coffee, you name it. He's had more than 35 years of experience in the area of research and development administration. Um, he's going to talk, he's going to pick up very similar questions to Peter Zenz. Um, Dr. Thomas, you're very welcome. Thank you for being here. Could you tell us, first of all, just in comparison with the northern example that we've just seen, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the approach of PDS Spices and, in fact, yourself in terms of your long experience uh, to managing the land, managing biodiversity, growing crops? And thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Philip, and uh, all, the, all, all the participants. In fact, uh, though it's south and north, there's not going to be much difference as well as the issues of uh, agriculture or farming is concerned, uh, uh, you know. Uh, but, uh, but in the south, where, you know, where in the India, uh, you know, India is a large country. Uh, can I have uh, the PPT, Shiva? Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, actually, we we actually uh, our focus has been our uh, small farmers i mean unlike what you have in uh, north we have the farmers or rather the whole uh, in the tropics we have uh, the farmers are very small if you take the india as a whole it almost 80 percent are small farmers and if you come back to my next next slide Trevor, now if i come back to where i am actually i am from the south uh, you know, Western down there, uh, the small state of Kerala, and where the uh, India farmers are small farmers. That is 90, 95 percent of the farmers are small farmers holding a, an average land area of one hectare. So that's what the uh, small area. So our focus has been, uh, action has been to support the, sun, uh, you know, sustainability of the for, uh, small farmer. So we believe that, uh, you know, an intensive agriculture, if you look at this, uh, you know, we, we need always a multi-cropping system in a small land because his land holding is so small. So we assure that there is always a multi-layer cropping system. If you look into the right side, our intention is to, you know, har harness all the natural resources to this fullest exam, you know, fullest. The top leaf, the trees will harvest, you know, 100% light and then it filters 75% light. Like that, in every story of life, we have a selection of plants that can tolerate that intensity of light and water. So if you have, uh, you know, different uh, combinations with uh, all the sustainable in the local area, sustainable food for the local area, as well as we cater to some of this product with very specialized product like spices for export. So if you feel that you have, a, you know, uh, some material for your feed and for the local market, as well as you have something for the export market, you will bring a bit more money for the small farmer. So one other thing is that we spread the risk of going for one crop because, uh, you know, you know, the market always fluctuates. So once the fluctuation happens, 
you always have to you know uh, nullify the fluctuations so we always look at uh, as far as wherever possible where the, wherever the water is there we always go for integrated farming as well not only the multi stage farming wherein you introduce some poultry or cattle or sheep or uh, fish so that uh, that uh, system also is a recycling recycling soil health uh, maneuver and soil uh, building system so always we try to integrate a farming system and the another focus we have been always looked at this that uh, you know local problems have to be addressed locally so we have been encouraging the farmers for as a innovator and we have uh, really encouraged our local farmers to come out with their own local varieties which can come in that particular soil and which has been carried over generations and we find excellent varieties equivalent to any high yielding varieties released by a private or national institutions you have most of the varieties that has come out in the locality are climate resilient farmer varieties and along not only the varieties we also started scouting for local uh, technologies farming technologies say for example last time we we never had a solution for a rooting hormone because every time you need a rooting hormone for a better generation then i find a small lady uh, who has been using uh, a moringa leaf as a rooting hormone for her cutting so no, no actually she got it just by observing his uh, father but wherever a rooting is needed you find that the cutting she, she used to keep or the father used to keep uh, on on the moringa tree so that uh, then why she started you know why this uh, father is looking you know keeping everything under the moringa tree so then only you understand that some benefits of moringa leaf is coming for rooting in the uh, plant and we have made a rooting hormone from moringa leaf and last time when uh, in the in the organic in the i form they wanted to see what is the solution for a rooting hormone i said i have one from my own local farmer who has come out with a moringa leaf uh, this thing so you find any problems and for localized uh, uh, you know mechanization they are the best to come out with solution if you uh, talk with them they find the solution and and they find the problem and they are finding the solution so we have been focusing on localization and we have a program called as uh, uh, land to lab program and there is where our uh, localization comes and through a biodiversity yeah next slide please uh, yeah uh, yeah and so all these missionaries and then what we see that we always developed an entrepreneurship whenever there is an in a small innovation we see that it is an made into an enterprise so that the farmer get an additional income so gis said uh, we have a project on bfaf and we promoted a lot of biodiversity and here you find that uh, you have vetiver grass it is a very good excellent soil uh, conserving crop and uh, once you plant it on the condor the leaves is normally used as mulch but we again made it into a women enterprise pronership uh, on a baskets so the leaves can be made into basket and the women are getting an additional income in the farm so whatever we do we try to uh, bring some economics into the activity in the biodiversity and here we use the women groups to come out with a small entrepreneurship on the innovations of machines machines and machinery etc so i think this is what we try to do uh, philip uh, uh, localized uh, this thing and again the last slide would always uh, uh, say that you know if the farmer is re really connected to his customer a farmer knows his customer and he will never poison his food and if a customer knows the farmer growing his food they will never bargain with him so if this is the our vision is to connect the farmer with the customer i think that's what we have been doing uh, all along philip sounds yeah. like great great wisdom indeed thank you thank you very much just um uh, can you just sort of supplementary question um it's one of the questions but we're going to have to move on but before we move on to the next presenter um you could have just decided in most of these situations just to grow one crop um where you have a decent market uh could you just very very quickly give us an idea are you are you sacrificing profitability or are you gaining profitability um and what other advantages are you getting through these superb and beautiful integrated systems that we've seen actually we are 
really balance, balances out the economics. I mean, we don't find much of a, by integrating different, uh, you know, uh, crops for the market and for the local market, as well as for the export, we are not compromising on, on the economics. Well, maybe we may be compromising on the total productivity. You know, in an industrial agriculture, you look only for productivity, but we diversify so that the farmer, farmer almost get the same income like what you get from the in, uh, industrial or intensive uh, uh, agriculture. And another thing is that we, because you diver, diversify the crop, the, the litter and the leaves and the organic carbon that's added into the soil keep the uh, soil so healthy and sustainable for the long run. So we, we, that's the advantage we see it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you from the, the beautiful state of Kerala. Um, we're, talking, we're talking about an agenda of change here. We're talking about moving on to a post-COVID world uh, where we have biodiverse, friendly, sustainable agriculture with value chains that actually serve the customer much more effectively and in a much more resilient fashion uh, than we've had up to now. If this shift is going to continue, if we're going to build back better, as a number of politicians are telling us we need to do, donors, NGOs and others will need to change the way that they provide their support uh, to communities. Um, it's going to be important to build on successful ways uh, that commercial agriculture becomes sustainable, communities are built up, people benefit and they're integrated into conservation efforts. We're now going to have a presentation from a very interesting company um, which is called The Poor Project. Um, we have with us Lorena Freer who is a regional manager uh, for Asia at The Poor Project. She's got an international, she has a background, I beg your pardon, in international economics. Um, she started working at Poor as a programs manager in charge of international accounts, such as Accor Hotels, a very, very big, hotel, big account, but also implementing agroforestry and sustainable agriculture programs in France and abroad. And abroad. In other words, right on the ground uh, with, with small communities. She has now moved to Bangkok to, her, to the regional office to take over the operations of management of their Asian field programs. So she's going to tell us a little bit about the interface between the value chains of commercial companies, communities, how, how the commercial companies are incentivized to improve biodiversity conservation with the communities along the way. Lorena, you're very welcome. Thank you very much indeed. So to start, to start with, just tell us a little bit about how you do this. How do you work with communities? Thank you, Phil. Thank you for the detailed introduction and also for the question. So Pure Projet, we are a mission company and our mission is to regenerate and protect ecosystems through community empowerment and supply chain strengthening. And to do that, for the last 12 years, we've been developing and operating more than 80 agroforestry and other nature-based projects with farming communities, mostly in tropical developing countries, so with smallholder farmers, but also now in North America, in Europe, uh, in Australia, in that case, more with individual farmers, such as Peter Zins, who uh, we heard just before. So we see ourselves more as catalysts or capacity builders or facilitators which means that our role is not to teach or to impose or to uh, do everything ourselves, but more to build local connections uh, on the ground and to empower those people. So to make things a bit more concrete, in the case of an agroforestry project, we usually uh, collaborate with farmer cooperatives who become our implementing partners. And then together we uh, organize training sessions on agroforestry in villages. Then we also um, meet each indi individual farmer at their farm to see the configuration of the farm, to understand what their challenges are and what their reasons to plant is. This is very important to understand from the beginning. Uh, and then we're able to advise them on planting models that are relevant to their farms. Um, of course, we take into account their own local knowledge and their own wish, especially when it comes to local um, tree species to plants. And this provides us a database of farmers and species to deliver to them. 
Um, so we also do the delivery of the tree seedlings and other inputs to the farmers. And then we do some monitoring on survival, rate, survival rates a couple of months after the plantation and uh, one year after it. A big chunk of our projects are agroforestry projects, but depending on the needs of the communities, and that's something that we always assess prior to starting a project somewhere, we can also develop uh, other activities such as gap trainings, uh, beekeeping, forest conservation, sustainable husbandry. But the idea for us is really to respond to actual needs, to raise awareness and to build capacity for the farmers and for the local stakeholders so that they can continue to carry over the project even when Pure and its sponsors, which are commercial companies, are not in the area anymore or are not supporting the project anymore. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much indeed. Um, let, let, let's turn ourselves. Let's turn our attention a little bit to the the links with um, uh, the links links with uh, companies. Tell me how how you, a little bit about how you work with commercial companies and how you ensure that they contribute to the well being of people and to the protection of natural resources while making a profit. Right. So our model was built on the very idea to engage the private sector in a meaningful way and to show that there is a business case in investing in the producing landscapes you source from, in helping the farmers shift towards more diversified farming system and restoring their ecosystem. Why is that? Because intensive monocultures have worked for a while, but now soils are depleting, uh, yields are decreasing, and with the accelerating effects of climate change, it's not looking good, <laughs> especially from, I mean, even, and especially from uh, a supply, a, a purchasing aspect, if we take the, the viewpoint of a company. So that's why we've pioneered with the insetting approach that we promote to companies, which means compensating the environmental impact of your operations but within your own value chain. And you do that not only for a carbon benefit, otherwise you could just buy carbon credits on the market. It's straightforward and probably cheaper. Uh, no, you do that for the overall supply chain resilience and for sustained supplies over the time. So what we bring to these commercial companies are analysis of their supply chains, which includes assessment on the ground, meeting local stakeholders, to understand what the key challenges are at community and landscape level uh, and trying to find together actions that we can undertake to address those challenges. Um, then, of course, we would be the one um, operating this with the local partners that we have identified. But here, the approach is really to have a holistic view, so to look at social, environmental, and business aspects to make sure that everybody benefits from the initiative. It's a lot of promoting medium to long-term approaches with not so automatic results and a lot of uncertainty because we're working with nature. We are not building cars. So sometimes it can seem a little bit at the opposite of the short-term approach of businesses. But to be honest, we do see a positive change, a positive trend. More and more companies really make the link between healthy producing landscapes and their own survival. And yeah, there's definitely a lot happening in the food and beverage and cosmetics industries, which rely a lot on raw materials such as cacao, coffee, vanilla, patchouli, you name it. Um, but there's also um, positive trends in other sectors, for sure. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so, where do we go in the future? What are your, what are your challenges? Um, if we want to see uh, if we want to see the benefits of Poor's work expanded, if we want to see this becoming more the norm than the battle, the uphill battle we've had so for so many decades, mm -hmm. um, what should we be doing? What's your advice? Well, for sure, something quite tricky in our work is that our vision is about long term. It takes time to build capacity. It takes time for mindsets to change. Uh, it takes time for trees to grow, to sequester the carbon, to actually uh, restore the soils. So 
our commitment to the communities and the farmers is actually of a decade. That's, you know, the kind of benefits that we socialize to them when we uh, present the, the potential project. Whereas companies would tend to uh, commit to support a project over a couple of years and with some level of flexibility, sometimes depending on the financial health of the company. And we're seeing that definitely right now with um, the COVID situation. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a bit hard sometimes to navigate those different time horizons, but our role as project developers and with my team, when we have to design a project, we have to think of those activities that we think are necessary in the future if we want the impacts to be sustained, if we want the trees to be kept on farm, if we want farmers to actually have market opportunities for the agroforestry co-products. And we need to think already of the budget that we need to provision from what we get from the companies so that those activities can be funded um, in the long term. So that's one point. Uh, a second point is that our model is to work with individual companies to develop uh, projects in their supply chains. Now, even in ambitious, great company programs, the reach in terms of beneficiaries or budget is sometimes just not enough to properly address the issues at landscape or regional level. Um, so we'd really like to see and even catalyze more sectorial or regional approaches to action, a little bit like what the Cocoa and Forest Initiative is doing in West Africa. So it doesn't have to be the same scale necessarily because this is a huge in initiative, but in general, I think it'd be very great and powerful to see more collaboration at, at pre-competitive level between companies and um, yeah, basically the idea is that a supply chain on its own cannot solve all the issues entailed by climate change or, or ecosystems degradation. So we definitely need to see more collaboration and, um, and, uh, and scale. And by the way, on this topic, we are currently exploring uh, the opportunity to develop a multi-stakeholder initiative in South East Sulawesi, Indonesia. So if you are in the area and interested, feel free to reach out and we can uh, discuss about it. The more the merrier, as we say. <laughs> and um, lastly, I would say that the challenge that you already mentioned, Phil, in your intro is that it takes a while to observe the impacts of nature-based solutions. So despite the fact that pure we've been around for many years, we still don't have a lot of scientific data on our projects, for example, on yields under agroforestry systems. Whereas this type of data, I feel would be key to convince even more farmers to engage in agroforestry or other practices. It would be because of course, there's still a lot of reluctance to changing completely the, the farming model. It would also be key for companies to safely engage in this type of program. And of course, it would also be key to convince policymakers that this approach to farming is to be supported. So yeah, I think we share really like this, <laughs> this observation and yeah, I really much agree with that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that um, fascinating, fascinating um, uh, presentation. We're getting a number of questions coming in, which are being, uh, which are being passed to me. There's a, uh, although um, we, the presenters, are rather separate from the actual question and answer session, I gather there's a, a very energetic exchange of questions going on. Perhaps I could just pass a couple of them to some of the speakers who have already spoken before going on to the, uh, before going on to the next one. I'll just, I'll just pick two of them out from Ian Dawson. Um, and I might come straight back to, you know, perhaps I'll go to Thomas on this one, if I may. Uh, it's a question of transaction costs. Uh, we're talking about transformation of agriculture, which has in many places set itself into a certain pattern. And we're hoping that it might transform itself into a different pattern. This is going to involve a great deal of um, transaction costs in the sense of acquiring knowledge, in the quest of learning how to do things, in, in the sense of um, modifying uh, value chains and all sorts of things. 
Do you have any comments on how do we minimize those uh, those tr those transaction costs? Is it a matter of is it a matter of scalability? Is it a matter of the need for some sort of subsidy to come in to help us with transaction costs? Um, what's your view, Thomas? In fact, it is uh, it's a matter of scalability. Supposing we are able to uh, uh, you know, scale up uh, your uh, uh, you know the, this philosophy of uh, sustainability, uh, there are a growing uh, concern all over the world where we can also uh, link with uh, uh, the world outside, so that they are also willing to the customers are also willing to support the real cost. Uh, of uh, transactionability. I mean, actually, uh, one advantage we have, of course, have we deal with high cost uh, or high high value uh, crops like spices, where um, we we command a large uh, international market for that, and so the farmers are, uh, you know, the whole uh, customers absorbs uh, most of the uh, cost on transparency and uh, customization. So I think uh, if the customers are willing, you find. A bit of a, a customer willingness and also a scaling up. We have more than 3,000 farmers. So once you scale up from a small, small hundred uh, to thousands of farmers, your transaction goes are going to be much, much lower. Uh, that's what our experience is. And of course, it's a, a long process. It takes around uh, eight to 10 years if you want to really stabilize it out. Uh, but you, you will succeed because the world is going uh, towards that. Okay, right. Um, thank you very much indeed. I think actually, in in the, um, the the interests of time, thank you much, very much indeed, Thomas, for coming in on that question. In the interest of time, we'll we, we'll 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 push ahead. And now we start. We're going to talk to someone who works with an NGO, but a very interesting NGO, uh, which, as I understand it. Um, has a foot in the conservation camp, if I can put it that way, um, and a foot in the, the agricultural productivity camp. And here, I think our whole discussion is about how do we get biodiversity friendly systems into agricultural landscapes. So we have with us uh, today uh, Tobias, Tobias Luders, who is a program manager for business and biodiversity at the Global Nature Fund. Um, he collaborates worldwide and uh, in issues of food standards, he works with food, food companies to improve biodiversity criteria in standards and in procurement systems. So Tobias, over to you. Well, thanks Phil for this introduction and um, thank you for having me. Well, I do work for the Global Nature Fund the Global Nature Fund itself, it's an NGO about 20 years old. Now, having this NGO, we do have different branches. And one branch that at the moment is quite successfully going on is actually the branch that's called Business and Biodiversity. And you may already know it's Business and Biodiversity. So it's all about the link between those two sectors. And more and more, the focus in this branch is going to the food sector. Now, in 2016, a team of a couple of NGOs, we have had a look at procurement guidelines and we have a look at standard criteria. And we found while many stakeholders want to target biodiversity in agricultural production, while the, the content of how they do this, um, there was room for improvement. Let's put it like this. Now, starting from then, we have had a live project, actually several projects, but the latest one is a live food and biodiversity project in which we, on one hand, um, further had a look at standards and company procurement guidelines, but also in which we closely collaborated with those stakeholders to find out together what are the best practices that can be implemented into agricultural production systems all over the world, and what actually is what the market can do, where are the limits and where are the possibilities. And you already said it, the leverage in this case, it is the criteria and procurement guidelines. So when the market source, they often give some frame data on how something shall be produced, 
And there's actually the point where we um, targeted. Now, all of this came really um, in a beneficial way. And the momentum it generated was even surprising for us. And you have heard the other speakers that at this time, there is a certain keenness of the market to go towards biodiversity-friendly farming. And so it is also with international standards and with the companies as source internationally. While having a lot of different recommendations given over the years, there's this one, but let me put it like this, this one really meaningful, most important, or the one recommendation that, that hit the ground um, harvest. And this was one that was called, that is called Biodiversity Action Plan. Now, we actually recommend, that, recommend companies and food standards to implement a management plan for biodiversity protection on farm level. And this management plan is called um, Biodiversity Action Plan. Now, it sets a focus on farm level, so it actually is a tool provided to farmers, a method provided to farmers to implement biodiversity actions, to set a baseline on, on what is the situation of those farmers, um, to find out the, the most crucial aspects to be targeted, and then go ahead and implement biodiversity measures to actually target the challenges that are there in the region or on the local farm. And this methodology is scalable. We actually did it in, in different countries all over the world. Our partner organizations are doing it quite successfully in Europe and also in other places in the world. So we over the last three years found out that there is room for scaling up and there's a possibility. And it's not that we do not know how, it is often that we just don't do it. So based on the biodiversity action plan, there has also been other developments that support this, this plan. So we introduced something that is called the biodiversity performance tool. And this is an online-based tool that helps companies, well, farmers, to generate a biodiversity action plan. Now, the sad thing about all of this is that the Life Food and Biodiversity Project ended now in September, but as all partners have been quite busy, in all national partners, so in all national, in all companies um, and organizations, we supported the implementation of national biodiversity initiatives so that the idea of collaboratively tackling this issue does not end with the project. And I would just like to focus on one point. One point that is the German biodiversity initiative in the food sector. And in this initiative, front runner stakeholders actually are forming right at this moment in time and building a collaboration and going public with this, hopefully at the beginning of 2021, saying that biodiversity is the topic to jointly work on. It is not always the topic to, to actually fight over but to tackle uh, in a collaborative approach. And here we are really keen to see how this is going to develop, not only in Germany, but also in other, in other countries. This is what we do. And um, I think they have great times ahead, although I all think that we have great challenges coming for us. Tobias. Tobias. Um... Thank you very much indeed. I, I followed that very well. Actually, your sound has been breaking up. I just want to, um, I'd just like to check with uh, our uh, technical support, whether that was a general problem that, that other people are having, um, or uh, it, it was it coming out for all of the feeds. Trevor, how did that sound? It came through a little bit goggly, but um, we can just uh, carry on. Okay, okay. Uh, right, thank you, th thank you very much. Yes. So, sorry to interrupt there, Tobias. I just wanted to make sure that um, everybody was able to hear 
uh, what uh, what you were saying. It, it sounds as though it's, um, it, it's it's getting it's getting through. I think you've you've answered um, one or two of the questions that um, uh, we were we were going to uh, we were going to ask you. Um, perhaps um, uh, if it's not repetitive, could I just ask you? Um, you've got a lot of experience out there, and this is going to relate to one of the questions which the audience has has posed, which I'll um, I'll I'll repeat um, as soon as you've replied to this. Um, what about obstacles? What has to change? Where do you find that your work really is very difficult to, to put into practice? Um, what do we have to do that, uh, that is different, that, that is new? Tell us a little bit about your, uh, what, what, what you think in this respect. Yes, obstacles. Well, obstacles, they are diverse and you will find specific the specific ones in every farming system and place around the world. But there are a few ones that are international. <laughs> so one of which, and I do think it is the most pressing to target, is um, lack of motivation to adapt. Um, but let me put it that way, it's not lack of motivation. Most of the cases it is lack of knowledge so we found that you have a certain set of methods to motivate farmers. One is it's regulation. So it's actually right now what we all do and hope with the uh, European agriculture policy so that there is um, politicians setting a frame and giving, giving a road to follow. Um, the other one is market. So it's all about money. So when a farmer actually does something, first question in many cases is, um, what does it cost? How much less yield is it causing? Um, who's going to pay for that? Uh, this is oftentimes short-time thinking. And when you start collaborating with a farm, and we actually did it with over 70 farms all across Europe, then you find out that the more farmers in general get to know about um, agroecological practices, for example. Um, the fewer the obstacles are, so the more they are willing to implement and try out. So I do believe that knowledge sharing and, and training is, is the most and biggest obstacle. And why? Because it is the farmer him or herself that actually has access to farm land. And we all acknowledge that farming land itself is a habitat in itself that developed over centuries, that has their own species, that has their own rules and frames. And if we want to actually get our grip on this farming land, then it can only be through farmers. And farmers, them or themselves, are also the biggest catalysts for this change, for the adoption of biodiversity-friendly measures in farming. So rolling out um, can short-term be done by market and politics, but long-term definitely it's a farmer who's playing the critical role. Okay. So Phil, did this answer your question? It does. It goes a long way to answering the question. Um, we're having a slight, some slight uh, technical problems with your feed, but um, it, 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 it got through. Thank you very much indeed. And you put a lot of emphasis in that on, um, on, on knowledge and training. And that goes back to the, the question that, um, uh, that Ian Dawson asked before about the, uh, about the the transaction costs of, of transforming to, a, to an agriculture of this side. There's another question which has come through from two people, um, Esther Milberg and Lise van der Meere. Uh, very simple questions. And they're wondering how farmers can invest in diversifying their fields and creating a farmer-led resilient food systems without secure land tenure and access and policies that support localized food systems instead of globalized ones. I think they're talking particularly about um, the African context, 
where land ten tenure is often not secure. Do any of the speakers um, want to come back and say anything about the interaction between land tenure, the security that people have to be able to invest in the land, and the willingness to, uh, to, to, to transform into uh, the sort of agriculture that we've, we've seen being practiced through, through the speakers today? Um, do we have any volunteers to answer that question? That's a great shame. That's a great shame. No, no, no. I think uh, I will take that, Philip. Thank you. Yeah. Please. Uh, uh, I mean, can you just repeat uh, uh, the crunch of the question again? About the this is the, the African. The crunch of the question is, and we 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 see this uh, a lot in Africa, uh, is the 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 unwillingness of farmers to invest in change if they don't have security of tenure over the land. Um, and the security of the tenure might be because they're, uh, because the, the, they simply do not have uh, legalistic systems in or they're poor in legal systems, uh, which make it difficult for the farmers to be sure that they're going to be able to use the land. Or it might be something banal that the land is becoming so subdivided that they're really, um, it's not worth investing at the, at the end of the day. Do you have any experience of that from India? No, most, yeah, we, we need to have uh, the land registered. But then what I would still, again, as a, I mean, as a visionary, I would say that, of course, if, uh, you know, the land ownership definitely remains a, if it's all an issue, why can't the farmers, you know, have a larger consolidation of a particular product, uh, you know, a short-term product, uh, of an annual annual product uh, which could be marketable uh, rather than looking for a long term because normally when you take into this you need a long, longer time five years minimum for uh, uh, for uh, you know sustainable system but uh, since I you do you have issues on land and then you don't have money or, or rather it's not worth investing for a long term program I would always think that we could uh, consolidate. Uh, more farmers and go for a short-term crops. I mean, that's just my wild suggestion rather than, uh, you know, experienced knowledge. Okay. Consolidation and turnaround. Right. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. The, the, the question that was posed there is without doubt a very important question. Perhaps in the chat, this is being, this is being dealt with. We'll come back to it um, when we can. Uh, we'll move on to our final speaker now. And we're very privileged to have with us um, a very senior government representative from the, the Indian government, uh, Dr. Alka Bhargava, and I trust I'm pronouncing your name correctly, um, Doctor. She's an additional secretary in the Department of Agricultural Cooperation and Farmers Welfare. Her primary responsibilities include overseeing the works associated with natural resource management, international cooperation, integrated nutrient management, and rain-fed systems. She's had a long uh, and very, very interesting career. She's done a lot of things, including being a Fulbright Scholar at Michigan State University. But I'm going to jump right to the last line of the bio that uh, I have in front of me. She strongly believes that sustainable agriculture and conservation are the two sides of the same coin with a strong ripple effect on the lives of people residing therein. In other words, we have a senior government official here who really sees the, the value of sustainable agriculture and conservation. You're very, very welcome, Dr. Dr. Thank Alka. You. Thank you so much. Um, just so we're going to jump back to what we said at the beginning, because you're right in the middle of, of policy making and policy for change. Um, can I ask you, what changes would you like to see happening in Indian agriculture as we part, start to recover from this COVID pandemic? Um, you might want to comment on the impacts that uh, it's had on Ind Indian agriculture and how it's affected particularly the poor people. But your views of what you'd like to see changing. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much and good evening to everyone. Uh, it was great listening to the various views of my the previous speakers. and. 
B, wherever you are across the continent, I think the issues are the same and the ways of tackling them are also the same. So when, uh, I mean, right now we, the, I mean, the world is grappling with a very peculiar kind of situation. And if I talk of our experience in India, I mean, the first uh, time the lockdown was announced was on 23rd March, 2020. So like Phil, you asked what should be done after this, uh, in a post COVID scenario, I'll just take about five minutes to dwell upon what we did during this period. So that, uh, I mean, with great pride, we say that most of the farming operations just carried on very, very normally. So when this was first declared on the 23rd March, it took exactly just three days for the government to, I mean, give the exemptions uh, to all farming operations as per the set calendar. And uh, everything just went off uh, as normally as possible. Because uh, the first thing that was uh, worrying us was the, uh, the standing crops in the field. So harvesting was the major first concern for us. And uh, of course, I mean, of, all this was done in the backdrop of detailed SOPs to the states to adhere to uh, health protocols and social distancing norms, etc. So, I mean, uh, all the harvesting was carried on as uh, was completed without any uh, glitch. Uh, the second issue was that uh, we have a short summer sowing uh, season uh, uh, starting around a May, May, June, July. So for that, all the inputs had to be sent to the, uh, to the farmers, including seeds, fertilizers, etc. And uh, very well done this also was because the sowing of summer crops was uh, done in 6.8 million hectares, which was 1.7 million hectares more than the previous year. So again, I mean, uh, credit to our farmers. And then another uh, issue was uh, when we talk about social distancing, our wholesale markets are major, major places of absolutely congested uh, places to work in. So that decongestion of the wholesale markets was another issue which we had to tackle immediately. Because once the harvesting was being done, they were going to the wholesale markets. So how do you get people to remain healthy but carry on their uh, transactions? So here uh, we, in fact, uh, some of uh, our audience may be aware that India had uh, had uh, quite uh, rigid systems of the farmers being able to take their produce to the nearest wholesale markets or perhaps a couple of them close by with, uh, I mean, there were state laws. I mean, agriculture in India is a state subject. So these were governed by our Agriculture Produce Marketing Committee Acts, which had been promulgated in the states in the 70s and the 80s. So, uh, uh, I mean, we encouraged the state governments to take out orders or ordinances to allow direct marketing. So a lot of states came forth for that because that was the only way the farmers could sell the produce outside these wholesale markets from the farm gates or cold storage or warehouses or wherever possible. Except, I mean, wherever required, they could come to the markets, but otherwise dispose of most of the stuff directly to the buyers. So this was one another thing which we could uh, tackle. And then uh, coming to the logistics, uh, an app was immediately launched uh, within uh, days almost of uh, like an Uber, Uber system of uh, tracking your, uh, the nearest truckers and the other logistic transporters, providers. So that uh, came in handy again. A lot of digital uh, backup was uh, taken into the for uh, coming over this period of our initial period of lockdown, and uh, of course the electronic national agriculture market, which was launched way back in 2017, 16, sorry, that also came into the play because then, like our farmer producer organizations, they could uh, upload their produce on the Enam portal, bid and receive payments from the collection centers without having to bring it to the markets. So this was another way of uh, decongesting the markets. Then coming to logistics, our Indian Railways, which has perhaps the largest network of railways across uh, the country. I mean, they came to the help by uh, starting uh, special uh, uh, trains uh, for uh, carrying the, uh, the horticulture produce, other perishables, and as well as the input supply for the forthcoming sowing season. So all this, uh, I mean, and these trains are continuing now because in the name of uh, 
uh, agri uh, the farmer rails we call it kisan rail in hindi so these are still continuing for carrying on uh, the the uh, i mean connecting the production places to the consumers so these all uh, kind of benefited us and made us uh, go through that uh, especially the initial period of covid and happily when uh, uh, it was also mentioned that exports were struck because of the various logistics and all but happy to inform also from india i mean uh, the exports during april to september last year and this year in 2020 there was an increase of 43% over the same period last year so i mean we did facilitate uh, agriculture exports also to go on as close to normal as possible and this uh, i mean this is how and this is what we going to continue now in the coming years and during this period also uh, during uh, these 3 4 5 months uh, there was a mission launched by our honorable prime minister which is which in hindi is called atmanirbhar bharat which means a self reliant india mission and in this there was number of components uh, which were announced special packages and uh, then there was another uh, uh, i mean uh, acronym uh, uh, announced what which was called vocal for local which has also been spoken about when we talk about agro biodiversity stress on local fruits local uh, vegetables millets local farming systems traditional knowledge uh, cropping patterns all coming back to our roots so that it becomes easy for the farmers also to do agriculture and it is also kind of eco friendly or uh, environment friendly and here again i mean there is a lot of uh, emphasis in the country on organic foods and uh, in fact we uh, are portraying india as a health and uh, organic food destination in the coming years because uh, during these uh, four months we've seen a, a steep increase in demand for organic foods both in the domestic markets as well as for exports and countries which were not known to be our destination for organics has been uh, i mean uh, calling on india for a supply of more and more of organic foods so this is where again it becomes very uh, good for health of the environment also and then there were a couple of uh, policy measures uh, acts which were uh, were promulgated during this uh, period uh, for facilitating an actual national agriculture uh, market for india where the farmers could sell from anywhere across the uh, i mean within the state or across the country in any state and the other way the buyers could also uh, buy without any licenses from anywhere across the country except that they had to have a their uh, we have a income tax uh, paying number so if they have that card then they could transact across the country so it's a kind of a win win situation through these three very important farming acts we promulgated in these two months uh, and also the second one is of contract farming so that the farmers can get advisories on what to grow and where to grow and how much to grow in the way of pre sowing farming uh, agreements with the sponsor which includes also provision of services so there i mean it's a win win situation for both the farmer as well as for the buyer or the industry or the processor so that they can get exactly that quantity that quality and uh, uh, of material which they require and the farmer also gets a, a assured price and an assured buyer so these are was how the things which happened and uh, because we are now self sufficient in uh, in all food grains except uh, oil seeds and uh, horticulture is also growing rapidly so in now from a food deficit country we are faced with the situation of surpluses and uh, becoming a major agri exporter agri produce exporter so uh, our focus is now more more on post harvest management so that is where phil where you ask is what we want to do now next is we have done the production so now we want to help the farmers as well as the industry by strengthening our post harvest management systems so the uh, ministry of agriculture is working very closely with the ministry of food processing industry and the uh, the department of agriculture research so that their entire agri value chain is taken care of right from the right right varieties new varieties climate resilient varieties and uh, i mean the processable varieties and we produce along with the farmers and then take it over to the ministry of food processing where a major emphasis on uh, strengthening the processing uh, capacity in the country so this was all i mean uh, uh, done during the covid period and we want to take it forward and then also uh, an agri infrastructure fund has been announced just last month a 13 billion dollar fund where uh, the uh, the major emphasis is on strengthening of post harvest infrastructure 
primary processing, cold storages, cold chains, etc. Packing, sorting, grading uh, uh, systems. And here, uh, I mean, anyone could uh, uh, apply for this fund and they get an interest subvention of 3%. So it approximately in India terms, it comes to around 5%. So which is a big, uh, I mean, solace for the investors. Because, and uh, this, in fact, if, uh, uh, I mean, this is open to uh, other countries also, if they want to come and invest in India, they can take care of, uh, they can take advantage of this agri-infra fund. So this was in a nutshell of what uh, we did during this period, and we want to take it forward and strengthen it further. Coming back to our local fruits, local vegetables, and uh, agro-biodiversity, and also happy to inform that we want to bring back the millets in a big way. And this was, I mean, uh, earlier there were used to be called as coarse uh, grain or coarse cereal. So in 2017, we, we renamed it as Nutri Cereals because they're actually very good for health, good for the environment and good for the farmers because low inputs are required. So also, uh, I mean, uh, India proposed uh, to FAO and uh, FAO conference has endorsed a proposal for an international year of millets in 2023. And uh, uh, so that will be a big thing, not just for India, but for the entire Southeast Asia and for the African countries. Because once the millets are back, I mean, uh, on the plates of uh, the urban uh, people and for exports, the farmers will be incentivized to grow them. And we're wanting to bring these also in our uh, school feeding programs, our, uh, uh, our uh, take-home rations for the prenatal and the postnatal mothers and for the infants, so that they come back to the roots and fulfill their nutrition. And along with this, we also have a lot of biofortification, biofortified varieties, and also fortification of rice, which we are also doing doing in consultation with uh, ICR, the Agriculture Research Institute, as well as with uh, the World Food Program, who had uh, come up with the uh, the fortified rice. Uh, they've done it. They've done some trials in our eastern state of Odisha, and they're bringing it to other states also. So that was in a nutshell of what we've done during the COVID and what we don't want to do beyond. Yeah, thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. You've, you've covered just about everything there. <laughs> um, that was absolutely fantastic. And perhaps we come into these discussions sometimes a little bit defensive saying, how do we make things happen? It's very refreshing to, to find a country where things are happening, where things are moving, uh, where things are changing. Um, I'm, I'm going to just pause a little bit in your, your presentation, if I may, just to say to the audience, there's going to be about 15 minutes left for questions and answers. So please use the chat function, get questions into the speakers. If you can, if you can direct them to specific speakers, um, all the better. They will be passed to me and I will pass them on to the, the speakers. But I'd just like to pull a couple of things out of um, uh, Dr. Alka's um, presentation there, and they're a little bit random, I apologize, but the sort of thing that came up was, as a result of the crisis, um, a lot of deregulation, making it possible for farmers to do things that they, uh, they couldn't do before. Um, this is policy moving quickly to, to, to re react to a situation. Um, digital solutions. The Uber solution, which you've heard of before, and we found this in a lot of other countries. People are now starting to look at, val at value chains and wonder how can we use modern communications to make our value chains um, more effective. And this is something that can last beyond the um, uh, beyond the COVID pandemic. Um, the reintroduction of um, land races that were before, particularly the millets that you spoke about. Uh, very, very, um, very important. Uh, we see this, this, this coming up in different countries under, under different, different guises. Um, what I'd like to sort of, what I'd like to, uh, to say, trying to, in some way, um, pull this all together, is that your focus on the post-harvest situation, um, very, very apt especially in developing countries, the level of post-harvest wastage, as we know, is very high, but it's taking you really from the agricultural production into the value chain. And what I would like to stress is that a lot of the time we shouldn't just be talking about agriculture, we should be talking about food systems. And if we want to see post-COVID uh, post change, we need to see that change throughout the system. Now, uh, let's go into the realm of 
the realm of negotiations and politics, if you could just tell us in two minutes, please. Um, we know that the negotiations are going on uh, in the Convention for Biodiversity. And those of us who are involved in that are very aware that uh, in the framework that's being put together for the period up to 2050, from 2020 to 2050, there are 20 targets and only one of those deals with agriculture. And agriculture so far is not really being seen um, as a habitat for conservation of biodiversity. Do you have any comments on this, Doctor? And do you think we should be looking for uh, a specific um, a specific agriculture target in the CBD uh, in the CBD negotiations? In fact, uh, uh, there may be just one direct uh, target uh, for agriculture, but India's national biodiversity targets. We've got six targets which uh, impinge agriculture. Like, uh, I mean, I won't read it out because of positive time, but uh, I mean, we are moving in the kind of, uh, targets are set or not. I mean, whether they are there in the post uh, 2020 scenario, but we are moving in that direction of agro biodiversity and agro ecosystems. Because post our green revolution of the 70s and the 60s, we, we did manage to get food self-sufficiency, but then there have been certain deleterious effects also. So that is how we are changing to, we are crop diversifying, targeting rice fallows, and that's how we improved our pulses production. And then most important is that we are now planning our crop partner, cropping systems as per the agroclimatic zones. We've got 15, I mean, India is huge. So whatever we do is on scale. So 15 agroclimatic zone wise cropping we're going to start and uh, taking into account the soil health and water use because agriculture is the biggest drawer of water. So that is where, I mean, we would fit in exactly into the uh, CBD entire uh, targets which they have. They may not be having uh, targets especially for agriculture, but we want to do it on our own because it is important for our national targets. So our uh, National Biodiversity Authority, and we are working very closely along with the Ministry of Environment of how uh, we can kind of make agriculture more sustainable because only then if we have agriculture, sustainable ag agriculture, just impinging our protected areas, then only the conservation can work. And in this context, I would like to also refer to the landscape approach which we are ad adopting in a number of our projects. I mean, the states have their own, but the national projects, one reference I could do is for the, uh, for the JET 6 project where five states are participating. And it's a very uh, kind of a very sensitive landscape uh, we've taken one side are protected areas and national parks and they're joining villages. So the conservation and development will need to go together. Then we've well, also got it, uh, yeah. We got a tea, tea project going on, yeah, under discussion. So again, the landscape approach comes in and agrobiodiversity, agro biodiversity, agroecology, yeah. Thank you very much indeed. And I look forward to that discussion coming up in the, in the next substance of the CBD. Uh, and, um, we look forward to those arguments being carried forward. I have a number of questions here. I'm not sure who they should all be aimed at, but thank you much, very much indeed, uh, Dr. Alka, uh, for rounding off this from the position of a, a central policymaker. Um, Jessica Carvajal, I'm not sure who, who this question is aimed at, so I'm going to ask Lorena if she would. Um, Oh, no, sorry. Um, it's a different one. It's Evelyn in Roma, Roma. And I'll come back to Jessica in a moment. And it is to Lorena. The question is, what size of companies do you work with and how do you approach them to promote sustainability? I think the root of this is, is this a, a marginal thing you do with small companies or, or are you bringing the big, the big girls and boys in? Right. So we actually do work with many types of uh, different size of companies. Um, but it's true that if you want to work in your supply chain and implement multi-year initiatives, it requires some level of um, budget to be able to get the resources there, etc. So for those, I would say, uh, large uh, supply chain programs, we tend to be approached by uh, companies that are of a significant size, um, but we also have some programs that are aimed at smaller sized companies uh, when it comes to uh, planting trees or supporting projects that are not directly uh, within your value chain or your uh, supply chain. There is also some projects that we have where 
uh, yeah, companies can have a positive impact and support farmers uh, in an area or in a commodity that they feel uh, they relate to. Um, and the way to build those uh, sustainability programs for, I would say, the big ones, um, it's a lot of work since the beginning to understand also what are the challenges uh, that the company itself uh, is experiencing and what are uh, already existing elements of their either purchasing strategy or carbon strategy. And based on that, we can build something. Uh, but again, before we start a project for a company, we will always conduct feasibility assessments on the ground, really meeting uh, the actors of the supply chain. So that means um, the farmers, the head of villages, uh, the local authorities, uh, NGOs that are already present in the area and potentially already working with those communities uh, to really make sure that um, we have an actual vision of what's happening there and what to, uh, what to implement that is relevant. So it's an integrated effort, not just a, not just a, a, a one-off in the middle of a, a desert. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, the other question, um, um, Tobias, if I may aim this at you, um, with apologies, um, uh, it's, it's from Jessica Carvajal, and I'm going to slightly paraphrase it, Jessica, if I may, because it's an issue which has been coming up in our conversations quite a lot. The question is, how can we promote different patterns of consumption and different diets when most people don't have access to alternatives due to a number of socioeconomic and political issues. Now, let me put this into a context that I know has been discussed quite a lot, which is for a long time, we've been pushing supply of food. We've been trying to get people sufficient calories and protein to get rid of starvation. And now we've suddenly realized that we need to be much more interested in the quality of food. And we have value chains out there, which basically have been set up to provide carbon staples to a lot of people all the time. Um, is this something that you'd, you'd like to, you'd like to uh, express an opinion on? How do you go about making that change when you've got systems locked in place already? Okay, yeah, thanks for this question. First of all, do you understand me better now than it was beforehand? I just it's certainly better. Changed. Certainly, okay, so great. Um, honestly spoken, there's no simple question a simple answer to that question. Um, systems are stuck in place um, in, in all types and areas and what developed over decades cannot simply turn around in, in days and weeks. Um, so it is what the colleagues of mine prior to me also stated. It definitely needs time, it definitely needs passion, um, it definitely needs communication, a lot of communication. Um, and then you have two choices. One is the bottom-up approach. This may work, and if it works, it's a more sustainable way. And the other way is actually top-down approach. Um, and there you can also argue whether, whether food systems or sustainability needs this or that way. Um, but it takes time. There's not this one single way to go Although I do feel communication about the benefits of local production, benefits of nutritional aspects, benefits of biodiversity, um, if this comes into place and is, is broadened, um, this may do a lot. Okay, uh, you broke up and disappeared right at the very end there, but we got your ah, message. Uh, okay, okay. The, time, the timing was almost perfect. And I would, say, I would add to that, of course, it needs, it needs a shift in investment as well. We have to spend our money differently from the way we've been, we've been spending it um, up, up, to, uh, up to now. Um, we got a question to Thomas. Uh, Thomas is, uh, I'm not sure who it's from, um, but it's the, the, word, the, the question is, thank you for your wonderful contribution. Those enterprises and entrepreneurs, who are, they who are they producing for? Are there incentives to integrate these into the local food systems? I think it's a question about the market that you're supplying. Was it there? Did you have to create it? Any comments you have? In fact, uh, 
uh, you know, we created uh, local markets for, uh, uh, you know, uh, we did a lot of work on the consumer side. We work with the consumer on the local market to, you know, sensitize the law, the importance of the biodiversity uh, enriched product. And uh, also we, we have uh, two, two prone action, one for the export and one for the local market. And so the, all the exports, uh, it's very easy because uh, already the world is going on that particular line. So it is easy to align with the world movement, but we have uh, problems with the local markets but uh, you know, in this part of the world, in the country, and uh, especially after post-COVID, there is a great realization on uh, on food as uh, you know uh, as a medicine. So rather uh, rather than in the, the right way that you have food and have medicine. So that philosophical change has made it more easy to uh, you know consolidate the innov farmer innovations. We always have a uh, you know farmer groups uh, being called as uh, you know aggregators and we support handhold them. So only, the only primary thing is that you need a strong institution to uh, connect the farmer to the consumer. So you need that. And that is where if that institutional support is not there, it always breaks up. So in our case, uh, PDS being a strong institution, we were able to find markets and entrepreneurship or rather we encourage entrepreneurship whenever uh, there is an opportunity. One thing is that for all small innovations, uh, say for example, a variety, what we do is that that particular variety, we try to name him in his family name so that variety gets a family name. And that gets uh, really circulating among, among uh, the local community. So this way we introduce the uh, entrepreneurship and uh, make it a successful endeavor. I, thank you very much. And um, a very important word came up there, which I was waiting to hear, was aggregator. When we're talking about food systems, when we're talking about farmers being effectively linked to markets, to consumers, the role of aggregators uh, is tremendously important. And um, thank you. Thank you for bringing, bringing uh, that, that up. Um, we're going to go back uh, to, um, to, uh, to Lorraine again. Um, and I think we're going to have to do this fairly quickly in two minutes if we're not if we're not to run over. Um, but the question is, how are farmers um, generally supported by your project and local stakeholders when considering improved farm man management practices and social stroke economic conditions? The key question here is, would you mind sharing an example? Just to, just to round us off, could you just give us a little example of of um, where this works and what you'd like to tell us. Two minutes. Right. Just is it, is it possible to hear the last bit of the question, especially when I didn't hear it? Yeah, okay. um, it's, uh, it, 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 it was basically, basically is how are farmers generally supported by your project and how are local stakeholders um, supported by your project? And would you mind sharing an example? Right. Um, well, which project to choose? Um, well, if I can choose a project from uh, my own region, we have uh, an initiative that uh, started uh, various years ago in Thailand, in northeast uh, Thailand, Isan region, which is the main producing uh, region for rice. Um, here we helped um, a company first, uh, L'Oreal, actually, to develop a supply chain of uh, sustainable uh, ran rice bran oil. And uh, rice brown is actually uh, an unused co-product of rice production. So building this supply chain was actually just using already what was there, but trying to link together the actors to find an, another way to use uh, this uh, co-product and then to generate additional incomes uh, for, for the farmers. And by establishing this supply chain, we also uh, implemented solidarity sourcing principles. So that means fair price pay paid to the farmers and also longer ter term commitments in terms of purchasing. On top of that, we also support uh, the farmers in uh, implementing agroforestry. So it might seem a little bit uh, weird to do agroforestry in uh, rice because it's a sun loving crop, but actually there's space along the dikes around the parcels to uh, plant trees. So how it would work, we work with uh, 
rice farming cooperatives that are uh, in the region. And uh, so with this farmer cooperative, we hire technicians, agronomists that are local and that are going to be able to operate the project on a day-to-day -day basis. So we uh, collaborate with these uh, technical people to then uh, establish or organize training sessions on agroforestry, uh, the main principles of agroforestry and the benefits, then also on planting techniques and how you maintain a tree right after having planted it uh, to keep the moisture, etc. And also more long-term management, how to prune the trees, etc. So it's really like a progressive approach to um, help farmers have a bit more faith in uh, planting trees in their farms where it's not always uh, so obvious for them to do so. Okay, I'm going to thank you very much indeed. Um, we, are, we are running over. Um, I, uh, I, I don't really want to, um, uh, uh, to get the wrath of the organization, uh, organizers by taking this a lot longer. Um, I've just had a message here, here um, if I can find it again. Uh, we have 937 people listening now, so tremendous interest out there. I do apologize to the people whose questions we didn't get to. We will go through them and where we, and we, we'll, we'll try to send them to the place where they should go. We've had some expressions of real interest in, uh, in our German farmer Peter's presentation. We can't get him to respond now, obviously. Um, he's not here, but we'll make him aware that uh, he had an impact uh, upon, upon this audience. There's never enough time to discuss a topic like this, but I really do want to thank the speakers. Um, they've given us a tremendous insight. And what I want to stress here is what we set out to do was not talk about the theory of the desirability of moving post-COVID to more integrated mixed farming, which is biodiversity friendly, which provides eco ecosystem services and all of the things which we need. We didn't want just a lecture on that. We wanted to get some people who really knew what they were talking about. And I'm very grateful for, the, for every panelist who has given his or her time uh, to this meeting uh, for giving us such a rich indication of what is really happening out there, which gives us fantastic confidence that we're moving in the right direction. We're not wasting our time. And if we can put our efforts behind you panelists, we'll do our very best. Thank you to everybody. Thank you to the audience. And we look forward to following all of this up. Goodbye.